Hello, this is Nick of Time. Welcome to the fifth talk in this series. Let me start by apologizing for the quality of the audio. Uh, the first uh, talk was made four months ago. The audio didn't sound that good, so the plan was to fix the audio problem. But four months later, it's not fixed. To make a long story short, I've tried everything, but for this system, the only thing that works is the webcam. So I'll try to talk louder, and hopefully that will fix the problem. Today we're going to talk about uh, the origins of special relativity and some of its problems. Uh, there are just so many uh, pictures of clocks, so I chose the cuckoo clock, which may seem mean to special relativity, but quite frankly some aspects of special relativity are not just counterintuitive, but seem cuckoo. Uh, and even great physicists such as Herbert Dingle have brought that point out rather dramatically. So we're going to try and do critical thinking on special relativity. What are the obstacles to critical thinking? Well, a lot of physics professors try to dismiss criticism or analysis of special relativity uh, by saying such things as, well, all serious physics professors know that special relativity is valid. Well, that's not quite accurate. Um, starting in 1905, when Einstein published his seminal work on special relativity, all the way to 1919, there was great disagreement regarding the validity of special relativity. Uh, then uh, uh, Eddington did his experiment on uh, does the sun do um, rays passing the sun actually bend like general relativity, and he did this during a solar eclipse. He then published that they, uh, the data agreed very closely with general relativity. Later it was found out that uh, uh, he kind of fixed the data to show that. Uh, so it really was his experiment at least was not accurate. But anyway, that changed the whole attitude about uh, general relativity and special relativity, and they were pretty well accepted and became more and more accepted every year. Uh, when Herbert Dingle came on the scene in the 1950, he entered into the twin paradox debate. Uh, and as R.G. Colwick commented, Everyone seemed to think that Dingo was wrong, but no one could agree on why he was wrong. Colwick agreed with Dingo. Later, Hassock Chang, then of Harvard, did an in-depth analysis of that debate and concluded that uh, Dingo's opponents did not address the issues that Dingo raised. Other opponents of special relativity include such uh, well-known names as Ives and Lovejoy, Jeffries, Mendelssox, um, Franco Soleri, Peter Hayes, Ian McCausland, Peter Beckman, C.S. Unakrishnan. And Krishnan wrote a long book, an analysis of the history of Einstein's views and showed that, in fact, one of the criticism, critics of the initial special relativity was Einstein himself. Uh, other critics were Turner and Hazlitt, who wrote the Einstein myth and the Ives papers. And in Germany, we had G. O. Mueller, uh, which actually I think stood for a group of German physicists who compiled a document discussing over 3,000 papers that were published in academic journals and that criticized special relativity. With a little different slant, we had uh, Jeffrey Builder and Simon Prokofnik in Australia who were saying that special relativity and 
Lorentz ether theory were really just two sides of the same theory. Um, and then I've come across many relativists, all of whom claim special relativity is correct, but then they say, but the mainstream has misinterpreted special relativity, and here's how it should really be interpreted, and they go on to describe various modifications to special relativity to make it make sense to them, but they come up with a quite different version than currently accepted uh, special relativity. So the claim that there is monolithic and always has been monolithic support of special relativity in physics and academia is not true. The next claim is that experiments have proven special relativity to nine decimal places. Well, there's one group of experiments that is completely consistent with uh, special relativity, but they are also consistent with Lorentz ether theory. There's another group of experiments where half the data is consistent with special relativity, and the other half is 180 degrees out of sync with special relativity, but that group also agrees with Lorentz ether theory. And there's a third group of experiments that totally disagree with special relativity and that are in sync with Lorentz ether theory. Now the problem why this hasn't been generally noted and talked about and published is that most people, most physicists, focus on special relativity. And they don't focus on ether theory from the previous century, from now two centuries ago. Uh, and, and the problem is that the two theories equations look identical. But the velocity component in special relativity is relative velocity, the relative velocity between any two inertial frames. And the Lorentz interpretation is absolute velocity, velocity with respect to a single preferred frame. So you have two totally different models and unfortunately when people start mapping the results of an, of an experiment and use an equation, they don't realize that they have gone from using the special relativity model to the Lorentz ether theory model. Now a few people have noticed this and, and published that observation, but it just has fallen on deaf ears. Most of the experimenters, as I say, aren't even, don't even think about that as something to, to test or reflect on. The third statement is special relativity is the foundation block for all of physics, especially uh, space-time physics. That's true, but it's not a valid argument to avoid critical thinking about special relativity. In fact, it's a strong argument to be especially careful in applying critical thinking to special relativity, as if the foundation of physics is built on special relativity, then you better be sure that foundation is solid. The other thing about critical thinking is that when they come up with one problem about special relativity, relativists often shift to a different interpretation of relativity that uh, doesn't have that problem. So the fact that the relativists have multiple conflicting interpretations makes it very difficult to do critical thinking and have critical thinking have an impact. Another obstacle to critical thinking is the fact that Einstein has such a fantastic reputation. Time Magazine put out, uh, puts out uh, the person of the year. Well, here we have person of the century. And Time Magazine isn't even a physics magazine. So this means Einstein was the greatest person 
in the whole 20th century. Why, to argue against Einstein on anything would be the, uh, would just be chutzpah, personified. Uh, and to argue with Einstein about special relativity, that would immediately mark someone as a quack. So it's very difficult to argue uh, against Einstein. But we will see, go, as we go through this, Einstein often argued against Einstein. He was very flexible. He shifted his opinions um, when the evidence showed that they needed to be shifted. So he did some critical thinking, but that's not well acknowledged by the physics community. In fact, Einstein himself said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. I think if Einstein were alive today, he'd be uh, amenable to taking a critical look at special relativity. Okay, let's go to the start of special relativity. Uh, Einstein inherited the relativity principle and was one of those who was expanding it from just mechanics to um, electromagnetism as well. He also inherited the concept of a constant speed of light and uh, that one was unable to detect the ether frame. So Einstein Stein then assumed there was no ether frame. He, he assumed that initially. Later he changed his mind and became a proponent of a preferred frame. Uh, so he concluded initially there's no preferred frame, therefore had a very strict interpretation of the relativity principle. And he asserted that all inertial frames had equally valid views of, the, of physics and of what was happening physically, even though those views clearly conflicted one with the other. Now this was original with Einstein. He said if the speed of light is constant, then time changes with velocity. Now this redefined time, one of the most fundamental qualities in physics, from what the view had been for centuries. And yet Einstein in his 1905 paper hardly mentions this major paradigm shift. And what's more amazing is that his contemporaries didn't jump up and down and say, hey, you've shifted the whole concept of time. And unfortunately, he shifted the concept of time for, for the worse. Okay, I have to repeat a slide that I've had before because this is just so important to all the rest that goes forward. So bear with me. Um, the relativity principle leads to the concept of the equality of all frames, and that leads to a frame-centric view of physics. But frames are just a math construct unless they represent a physical entity where, for example, motion with respect to that entity causes physical effects. But again, frames are not in general the causes of what's happening physically in space-time physics. Yet special relativity is a frames-centric view of physics. The paradigm that all frames provide equally valid views of physics removes the preferred frame construct, which in turn removes the physical entity that's the key to much of physics. This is the problem we're going to see in special relativity. Now as I said before, since special relativity is one of the foundation building blocks of modern physics, you better be sure the foundation is correct. Because if the foundation is flawed, then no matter 
how many stories you build on uh, your edifice of physics, it's just going to start leaning and leaning more and more and eventually collapse because you don't have a strong foundation. Okay, now we're going to get into some very new topics. Uh, talk about those. So we've been talking about special relativity is a frame-centric physics theory. Now relative velocity is one of the key, in fact primary constructs of special relativity. But what's the physical meaning of relative velocity? Well two objects that are relatively close to each other, uh, it seems obvious. Like if you have two cars, one's going at 35 miles an hour and then another is coming up behind it at 40 miles an hour, uh, it's intuitively obvious that the relative velocity is 5 miles an hour and it, the physical meaning seems perfectly clear. And if it, if the guy who's catching up doesn't step on his brakes and crashes into the other car, it, the collision is defined by uh, the relative velocity of 5 miles an hour. That's easy to understand. But let's think about uh, uh, the Earth and a star that are separated by 5 billion light years of space and 5 billion years of time. The star emits some light and 5 billion years later that light is received by the Earth. And according to special relativity, the uh, shift in frequency, the Doppler effect, uh, is determined by the relative velocity. But what is the relative velocity in that context of that large a separation of space and time? It may even be, well, when the light is emitted five billion years ago, the Earth should not have even existed. And suppose right after it emits that light, the star goes into a supernova, then at no time does the star and the Earth exist at the same time. So there the concept of relative velocity becomes a much, much more muddy. Uh, it's something to think about as we do critical thinking. So what is the relationship between absolute and relative velocity? Well, Professor Frankel, Frankel uh, wrote a paper, published a paper, that said if one takes the normal model for the Doppler effect, where one uses velocity of source with respect to the medium, and then velocity of the receiver with respect to the medium, one will get the normal Doppler effect for, say, uh, sound moving through a medium such as air or water. Now let's shift over and uh, the wave is a light wave. Well, Frankl shows that if one then uses the relativistic law of addition for the velocities to convert from absolute velocities to relative velocity, one gets the relativistic Doppler effect equation. Well, my contention is here we have two models that are equivalent, at least for the Doppler effect. Uh, but it would seem to me that the model using absolute velocity with respect to the medium of propagation would give the better model for portraying what's happening physically much easier to see those physical effects of the, of the source emitting light and that being affected by its speed relative to the medium of propagation and for the receiver uh, receiving light and that reception uh, and the frequency it sees being determined by its velocity with respect to the local medium. 
Let's continue looking at relative velocity with large separation. Einstein himself said all physics is local, meaning that physical effects are due to the physical interaction of two entities, not action at a distance, like we just gave an example. Relative velocity is usually the velocity between two separated entities outside of collisions. And sometimes they're very separated, like all of astronomy. We're talking about very separated entities. And again, that seems to imply that physics needs absolute velocity, which is velocity with respect to a single local entity, such as the ether medium or some, some field, like the gravitational field. Okay, using relative velocity, what are the limitations of special relativity's kinematics? Well, velocity is part is a component of momentum and kinetic energy. But if we have relative velocity, that yields relative momentum and relative kinetic energy. Those terms aren't used in textbooks about special relativity, but they are more insightful terms. So those two then become multi-valued entities varying from zero to high values. So if you're in a frame that's the same frame as, a, as a, a, an object, then you're going to see that object is having zero momentum and zero kinetic energy. But if you're in a frame that's moving at a high speed with respect to an object, you're going to see it having very high relative momentum and very high relative kinetic energy. So the fact that the values for relative momentum and relative kinetic energy can vary all over the place, at that, you know, even for one instant in time, suggests that these are not physical properties, because a physical property would have a single value. Hence, in my view, relative momentum and relative kinetic energy become math modeling entities, and not physical constructs. This is what you get from a frame-centric model. It's really a math modeling uh, model as opposed to a true physics model describing what's actually happening physically. Again, I contend that a physical model of what's actually happening physically requires absolute velocity with respect to a single local physical entity. And it's that interaction with a specific physical entity that gives specific values uh, that is the essence of what's happening in a cause and effect relationship. To drive home the point from the previous slide, let's look at a picture of a blue particle and a red particle coming together and having a collision. In the frame that's at rest with the blue particle coming in from the left, uh, the blue particle will seem to have zero relative kinetic energy and zero momentum. And all of the momentum and all of the kinetic energy will be ascribed to the particle coming in from the right, the red particle. But if we shift to a different frame of reference in special relativity, and we go to the frame of reference that's uh, at rest with the red particle coming in from the right, 
then we will see the the opposite. We will see the red particle as having zero relative momentum and zero relative kinetic energy, and all of the momentum and all of the kinetic energy would be ascribed to the particle, the blue particle, coming in from the left. So we have different values for relative kinetic energy and relative momentum depending upon which, which frame. So these cannot be physical properties associated with uh, a particle. They, they are a mathematical construct or mathematical model. Now we've been going for a while so uh, I'll close again with the key driving concepts chart, but I'll just look at the second bullet and note what we've been talking about, that frame-centric physics hides the cause and effect role of the physical entity associated with the local preferred frame. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, next time, we'll continue talking about special relativity. Uh, so I hope you'll join us again. Thank you.